Uh, good morning, all. I'm John Hotchkiss, chairman of the TAC committee here. Uh, before we do introductions, I would like to thank our two commissioners that are here today, Ed Carmen, Bill Connor. Thank you very much for attending the meeting. It's, uh, Stratford Regional Planning is a large organization. TAC is just one little piece of it. You folks are up on the higher level, I believe, the policy and so forth, setting the policy for the Stratford Regional Planning. So thank you for coming. All right. Uh, we do not yet have a quorum, but we can conduct business as long as you don't take any votes. And hopefully, in a few minutes, enough people will show up and we can take some votes on minutes. All right. So John Hodgkiss to my left. Alan Barton, Stratford Regional Planning. Dan Kamara, Stratford Regional Planning. Mark Ambrosi, Stratford Regional Planning. Lee Levine, Federal Highway Administration. Paul Lockwood, New Hampshire DES. Bill Connor, Summersworth. Ed Camo, representing Goldfield. Dave Sharble, Summersworth. Steve Ireland, New Hampshire DOD District 6. Good morning. Victoria Parmley, Northwood. Good morning. How you doing? Greg Jones, SRPC. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Looking down the agenda, staff communications from Dan. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know uh, we're actually we're having some major malfunctions with our, our plotter, which is our large format printer in our office right now. Um, over the summer, we started to, to have some small issues with it and noticed it was kind of failing slowly. Um, and I got a major error a couple weeks ago. I've been working with HP and our IT consultant, and it seems like it's either going to take some expensive parts, or um, they might even suggest just replacing it in general. But right now, we really don't have the, the funds to replace it. So we may be reaching out to you know some communities who maybe have a plotter that might want to help us with some printing assistance uh, in the short term uh, until we can either get our issues resolved with our plotter right now or possibly get a new one sometime in the future. But I uh, just wanted to kind of give everybody a heads up about that. Right now we don't have any ability to print any uh, large format maps right now. So I just wanted to uh, let everybody know about that situation. By large format, that means anything bigger than 11 by 17. So still need 11 by 17, we can do that. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. You are? Marsha Gassis, the Barrington Town Planner. Barrington, okay. I believe we now do have a quorum. All right. We have a bit of a dilemma, but we'll work our way through it. <coughs> we now have a quorum to vote on November's minutes. No, December's. I'm sorry. This is January. We're voting on December's minutes. Fine. But at that meeting, we didn't have enough people to vote on the November minutes. October. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, in your packet is the December minutes, but not the October. So it appears that we can have you read the December minutes. If you agree, we'll vote to accept them. But the October minutes are still in limbo because they're not part of the package today. My apologies. All right. So. Any comments about the December 7th draft minutes? I was I was one. Good. I was present. Oh. Not listed in either. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I might have been you weren't. I might not have been on the uh, sign in line. Yeah, I did leave a little bit. Okay. I will add I'll uh, add you to that. I'm sorry. Early, but I was here for the Federal okay. Highway presentation. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, Dave. I'll, no I'll change that. I was here as a guest. Yep, I have you on there as a guest. Yep. The sign in is still down there. Okay. Just pass that around and make sure everybody gets it, please. All right, any other errors or omissions concerning the December 7th minutes? Is there a motion to accept those minutes as presented, with the exception of adding your yep. name to it? Okay. So moved. There's one. Is there a second? Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving seconded to accept the December 7th 
Military. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We need another sucker. Do we have another sucker? Okay. Anybody? Okay. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So all in favor of accepting the minutes of December 7th. So all right. And opposed? Pass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last gentleman came in, please. Hi. Steve Pesci from the University of New Hampshire. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else need to sign in? All right. Thank you. We're down to item number four. Project solicitation. Mark? All right. Um, please. I feel like we haven't stopped talking about project solicitation since our, our last round a couple of years ago. Uh, it's kind of been a long process. We've been working very hard getting all these projects. I've got to thank Greg on, on all his work that he's done for us. Um, basically, we, we used our last project solicitation as a screenshot of our GIS system um, to basically get every single project from the <laughs> transportation improvement program, which is that short range plan, all the way out to long range plan and vision projects into our GIS system. Um, so I guess for the first time, we're, we're all digital with our, uh, our project solicitation this year, which is going to be hopefully make things a lot easier um, and easier for us to actually do some analysis and, and work with these projects instead of just having it on a, a paper sheet in the Metro plan. Um, so what we have here is just a screenshot of our GIS system. This is uh, in Barrington. Each of these are, these dots are projects, these line segments that are colored, um, red are also projects. And uh, this really gives us the ability to throw on some different layers of information like wetlands, um, census information, pretty much anything uh, that we have in, a, in our GIS system we can now overlay and um, do some analysis comparing it against our, our project list. And this is hopefully going to make our our process a little bit more uh, efficient. It's also going to make it easier to tell if you know, projects are feasible, if they're being built in a you know, wetland zone. It's going to raise the price an awful lot. So uh, we're really happy about having, having this together. And so with that project solicitation this year, um, it's the winter of an odd numbered year. So we go out to communities and and ask them if they have any new projects for our project solicitation process. And so this year, um, I have a, a slightly different process we're going to hope to do. I hope to give a little bit more information to communities up front, explaining exactly what the goal is, explaining which projects are already in the plans, which plans they're in. We're going to have maps so that communities can actually look at their plans. They can quick view of what that might look like. This is our, our master map here of, of all the projects in our region. Uh, but zooming in, um, just go to one on 16 here. Uh, communities will be able to click on the project in their region and up pops the information that we have about it so that they can see the project. Um, and this is basically just to see what, what's existing already in the plans. and. This information talks about the project type, what plan it's in, where the location is, uh, a little bit about the issues uh, that triggered this project to be added, and the scope of the project, or possible scope of the project. Um, and so along with that, we're going to be sending out uh, this Excel sheet for communities to review. The Excel sheet's going to contain all the projects within the community that are in the plan currently, or in any of our plans currently. So in this example, I just took all the regional projects that are kind of the, the Strafford uh, projects that we put together with assistance from 
the communities last time. Um, so going through here, we have the location of the project, the root road, or root or road that it's on, project type, um, description of the project need, anticipated scope of the project, um, and then the plan that the project's in. So we have uh, two different plans, well, two different plans here, three different project types. So we have the transportation improvement program, it's a short range, metropolitan transportation plan, and then we also have a couple of vision projects here, which are also in the metropolitan transportation plan. And then we have the question, is this project still important? Um, and which plan should it be in? Basically, uh, metropolitan transportation plan, or should this project be in uh, a vision project? So, trying to provide a little bit more information. This is going to come out, um, you know, hopefully with a couple of sheets to really guide communities through this process. Um, and this is going to be sent out to communities before we go and meet with them, so that they have an opportunity to review the information, respond to the information. So we, when we do go have a meeting with them face to face, we're actually able to uh, discuss the projects and the changes instead of, uh, I think in the past we've, we've gone to these meetings and we haven't been entirely prepared, the community hasn't been entirely prepared and I think the, the meetings could be more productive, so that's the goal uh, this time around. The next tab over, we have directions and an area for communities to fill in any new projects that haven't been included yet on any of these plans. Um, and so I just filled in a, a random project here. Uh, it's a regional project. Um, this is, would be on basically a new transit route on Route 11. Uh, or not a new transit route, but um, shorter headways, so more runs per day because Perhaps the transit or the bus is filled up every single time and there's demand. So I'm just putting this in as an idea. And this is what we would expect communities to have filled out if they have any new projects before we come to a meeting so that we can discuss any new projects they might have, why those projects are needed, and maybe some alternatives for those projects. Um, the last tab, I haven't really gotten to it yet, obviously, uh, is transportation priorities. And we are going to be requesting that communities identify what the most important uh, transportation priorities are in their community. So those would be things like safety, um, intersections, red list bridges, we need more transit, we need more, uh, you know, whatever, whatever those might be. But we'll, we'll be providing a list of uh, criteria, so, you know, what transportation topics we're talking about that kind of relate to what Dan's going to be talking about next. Um, and we're going to have communities rate those so that we have an idea of you know, what is the most important transportation priority, what should we be focusing on in the region. And that's really going to help us um, direct where these new projects get put into the metro plan and also help guide us when we go through uh, project prioritization for the New Hampshire statewide tenure plan. Um, what else do we have here? And that's about it for the, the project solicitation. Um, we're hoping to go out with this, probably sending it out over the next couple of weeks. We'll be sending it out to all the communities, um, uh, the community planner, the I guess, governing body, the board of selectmen, or uh, the council. We'll be sending that out to, and anybody else that we should send it out to. Um, if, if anybody here knows other contacts within their community that we need to be including on this list, uh, please just shoot me an email. Uh, email is on the, on the website, so that should be pretty easy. Um, so once again, the process is going to look like we're sending out the information to a community um, with directions. Hopefully they can go through that information, um, bring it to the necessary boards, uh, to approve their list and then uh, Stratford Regional Planning will be going in and having a meeting with the community just to discuss those projects and priorities. And that's basically the process. Yep. Thank you. Questions? I think it would be useful to um, 
when you go out to the towns to talk about how a priority in one town may relate to priorities in others along a golden card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you I think can do it, you can do it uh, mapping. Yeah, I think the the Google Earth that was that was one of the goals here is to is to really help give an idea of you know how these projects tie <coughs> into other projects. Uh, instance, I think we'll zoom in down here. It's on Route Four. It's going to populate that. Look like it. But yeah, a transit route along Route Four from the seacoast to Concord. This would be more of a regional project, and we've had a discussion about those. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Mark, just a question. Uh, do we have any information on the CMAC and TE rounds? What's your expectation that we would kind of throw out bookmark ideas now with the expectation that there's going to be rounds announced by the DOT this in this process? Um, my guess, and I, I haven't heard too much from DOT about this. I know last year, uh, Commissioner Clement was really interested in having other CMAC round. Uh, it's congestion mitigation and air quality, um, competitive grant rounds. I think DOT at this point is still figuring out how that works because NACHO has become a uh, TMA, which is a area over 200,000 people and that changes the way uh, the CMAC money works a little bit. Um, so I don't know exactly what the status is. I think there's very little chance that there's going to be a transportation enhancements round before uh, 20, I don't want to give a date even. I, I don't think there's going to be a transportation enhancements round. Um, from what I understand right now, the projects that are already in TE are quite a bit over budget and um, and as I guess transportation enhancements has gone away and it's now part of transportation alternatives so I think DOT is still sorting that out about what that means exactly uh, we are looking forward and I will keep everybody posted for any information that comes out about um, transportation alternatives or CMAC um, Definitely not a bad idea to at least put CMAC projects forward. Um, at this project solicitation, we'll be including it in the plan, and once it's in the plan, I think it's a lot easier to turn those projects into a, a competitive grant. And it'll also give us the chance to, um, to vet the projects a little bit, get it into our GIS system, you know, do the wetlands, do all the, all the stuff that we can do ahead of time so that we can really make the project go smoothly once Getting ready for the application. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just curious um, when you ask communities when you're soliciting for the long range plan for projects, are you asking them to also provide a cost estimate for their projects, or is that something that, that you guys do um, or trying to do with the MP? Well, I know that we're not great at making cost estimates in house. We're not, I mean, we can do, I guess, ballpark figures of order of magnitude, but it's, it's tough for us to make I guess, anything accurate for a long-range plan project. We did our best um, with the last update. What I can do is, you know, part of this was hoping to get a little bit of feedback about the, the way we're doing it and the criteria we're asking for, but I think it is a good idea to you know, ask for a preliminary cost estimate from the community while we're going out. Um, or maybe the road agent has a good idea about what it costs to redo a bridge or an intersection or something. So yeah. we will include that on the, the list. We would, have, have, we would have uh, rough cost estimates for what's in the long range plan right now. So any projects that uh, were on that first list that Mark showed that are already in the queue, so to speak, we'd have some cost estimates already for those. But any new projects, yeah, new projects and vision projects, we don't have anything. Maybe um, DOT might be helpful in trying to provide uh, some information to help yep. you do that too. Yeah, just for project types, you know, a general intersection with adding a lane, turning lane or something and signalizing. Right. So I think it, it would be helpful to have that information when you figure out what project um, is a, has standing in the plan versus the visionary the vision projects. Yep. Um, and we had to, we had where to, to draw that. that line in terms of what's available for revenues for those projects. Yep. <coughs>
Okay. I have a question. Yes. Because I'm rather new to this. Where would, if it's not a state road, if it's a local road and you have a bridge replacement, would that fall <laughs> under this? Yep. Okay. Yep. We've tried to put all the projects that we can get in here um, into the system, so we're kind of covering everything. And if it turns out that there's federal funding available for you know a local project or certain types of project, then we already know what the project is, and we can you know, make the suggestion that that one comes forward. Yeah. And actually, all the bridges, I think we have every single red list and functionally obsolete bridge already included in our, our metro plan. Okay, because we already had, I guess, recently the selectmen did actually vote to at least sp spend money. I think it has to go to town meeting, but for um, at least to start some engineering, some initial engineering, yep. so we can get it in the get it in the queue for for funds. So. Yep, yep, yeah. The state age bridge, age bridge program yep. is, is probably what you're looking at. All right, I think we're ready now, please, for the 10-year plan. Dan? Thanks, John. Um, no, I just I sent around, I don't know if we made it all the way around, but I sent around a few handouts there. Those could just make it their way around. Sorry. Um, part of uh, this 10-year plan process, um, as you probably know, in, in past rounds, <clears throat> the ten-year plan has been said to be more of a you know, longer-range plan, more of a twenty or I've even heard forty-year plan. So it was brought up that we might want to do a what's called a lean process on, on the ten-year plan, try to make it more efficient, more valuable, ultimately to the end users, which are the people who, who use the transportation system in New Hampshire. <clears throat> um, so part of that effort. What we did is we sat down and tried to map out the current process as it is right now. Uh, we did that, we tried to look at it and see where there was room for either shortening time frames, um, modifying steps, or even removing them completely if possible. Um, so we went through that. We didn't get quite as far along in the process as we wanted to. Uh, we started a, a little late in the game and we had a, a lot to talk about really. It was a, quite the involved process, really. It naturally takes a while to go through the entire process. Um, but two major things that came out of, of the lean process were um, this idea of a standard set of project selection criteria or prioritization criteria, and also a project initiation form. Uh, we don't have the project initiation form. That's, that's probably going to be something that we look at in the next 10 year plan process, but we do feel like we made enough headway with the project evaluation criteria where we can uh, use them on a, at least a general basis this time around. Um, so what you have going around there and some of you have already uh, are the criteria uh, and also a little sheet that explains the individual criteria. <coughs> um, now it was unanimously uh, agreed upon that this is not perfect. Some of these, as much as you want to keep them separate, some of them just naturally overlap. They, they, they have a lot in common with, with others, so it's tough to keep them separate. Uh, but what you see on, on this handout here is you have your different bins or, or columns, uh, and then within them you have uh, specific criteria. The guidance that we've been given so far is that we can, you know, us as, as an MPO, TAC policy, we can encourage to use these same criteria, and we, we have sort of agreed to use these criteria, but we can, we can weight them as we want to, um, with the understanding that once our projects move up to the state level, the state's really going to be focusing on the, the uh, two columns to the left, state of good repair and safety. So there's, those are going to be their two main priorities with this 10-year plan process uh, when you're looking at these criteria. So it's important when we move forward and, and try to prioritize our projects that we keep that in mind, even though we can 
we can look at other criteria and, and weight other criteria a little higher if we want to, but definitely keep in mind that state of good repair and safety are going to be top of the list as far as DOT is concerned. And I'll also be using, it's this new, it's, it's really a model, it's, a, it's an online um, model called Decision Lens. And what you do is you take these criteria, plug them into the model, there's certain weights, uh, rankings, uh, you have to go through a, it's a fairly lengthy process where you, you're asked what's more important mobility or safety, uh, what's more important, economic development or mobility, you have to um, you have to tell the model that these things up front. So when you start plugging in the data for each individual project, it knows how to rank them, basically. Uh, it's a pretty neat software. We actually have another meeting about it uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so Mark and I will be attending that. We're definitely uh, anxious to to get some better insight on that model and see how it's, it, it might shake out. But uh, again, this collaborative lean process, we see this as a as taking the 10-year plan process in a, in a good direction, more efficient direction, and, and hopefully ends up being more valuable. And hopefully makes you know, projects move along a little faster. Um, but that's, that's really what's happened with the lean process so far. Again, we we have this criteria to work with. We can use it as we see fit, but again, the state uh, is, is going to be focusing on state of good repair and, and safety. So, which is understandable. Those are important criteria to think about, uh, as are all of these. But uh, the situation, funding the way it is right now, and projects backlogged, you know, it's, it's sort of. Uh, what we're stuck with right now. But, um, so I don't know if anybody has any general comments on on that, but that's that's sort of what we what we have moving forward. So we'll be taking what Mark gets from communities and agencies. Uh, we'll be bringing it back to TAC and policy uh, using these criteria try to get some regional rankings for the projects in our region, send them up to DOT. We'll also be getting a list from uh, the district, uh, District 6 and, and District 3 as well for projects in our region. Uh, so we'll be ranking those, which, which is another big difference actually. We've, we've never actually been sent projects from the district to rank along with our other projects. So it's, it's, it's changing a little bit, but hopefully it's changing for the better. Um, I think some of the, the really nice things about this is the first time we're all going to be, by saying all, I mean, DOT districts and the other regions, we're all going to be kind of using the same criteria and we're going to be able to compare projects in much, uh, across regions much easier. So we won't have nine different scoring methods and then it goes to DOT with a 10th scoring method, and we have no clue what any of them are based on. I think this is going to kind of equal the playing field. And I think another big goal, uh, I think this is from the regional side and the DOT side, is to do a better job of accounting for those mega projects. I think a mega, you know, some of those mega projects may not score as, as highly with this criteria, and that really, uh, I think that's good. I think that's something we need to think about. and. Uh, we need to think about our resources and how we're using them. And hopefully this will give us a better, I don't know, measure about how far each dollar is going um, when we invest it into a transportation project. And over time, hopefully it will direct us towards which projects really work to achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve within the, within the state. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys, um, just a question, I don't know if you guys do. Have you guys ranked put weights to this criteria yet as a region? We have not. Okay. Yeah, no. So you're going to wait until you get the projects and then do it individually on the project? I think I think during or, or for the next TAC and policy meeting, it's, it's probably best to try to shake that out sooner rather than later. Um, you know, this is the first time that, that TAC's seen it and policy, we'll, we'll see it in another couple of weeks. So. 
hopefully a month to you know, mull it over would be, would be enough to move towards that. I think we were initially hoping to get access to the decision lens so that we could actually see what it looks like when we put a project through before we do all the ranking, but, or, yeah, weighing and everything. But um, I guess it hasn't been available quite yet, so. Run yeah. through with our own, yeah. I just saw it for the first time um, yesterday, actually, and it's, it's pretty neat how it works, and they have the weights, and then you put in the project information, and then you show what um, criteria it most affects, and then, it, and then after that, it ranks it without looking at costs, and then you get your costs brought in, and then it ranks it based on your budget, and it's pretty interesting how yes. it all shakes out in the end. So it's it's great. It'll bring more transparency, repeatability, and flexibility to the process. So, so I guess the message you could take back to DOT is that our next meeting is the first Friday in February and then one in March. And so we have two months to get the criteria process set with the TAC and the policy so that we can be on schedule to get this in you know, when it's due in early spring. Thank you. So <laughs> I understand this is the graphic, so, but one thing that struck me is under alternative modes being blue as an RPC, that, I mean, obviously that makes perfect sense on pedestrian issues and bicycle issues and, and regional transit issues, but um, from a state perspective, you know, some of the things we've been grappling with, whether it's Boston to Portland or Portsmouth to Manchester, um, obviously that model breaks down. Um, so I would hope that there's some appreciation that given New Hampshire is a small state in the New England region and that many of our macro transit issues are really beyond Stratford region, we have to have some way of accommodating these multi-region alternative movement. And I think that's key to economic development and mobility. I really wish we had used the term accessibility instead of just mobility. but. That was one of the major comments, actually, was it shouldn't just be mobility, it should be mobility and accessibility, they really go hand in hand. So. But I think your, your last point, this graphic and the focus on the two left is the result of a framework of not enough resources for maintaining the system we have, let alone, and <clears throat> that's a macro issue. I mean, if we were in a different climate, where if we move to a different climate, the graphic and that focus on the two left would change. And I think that's a macro point that we all have to keep in mind. But I do hope that, and I'm speaking as a member of the rail authority, but it could be if I was dealing with inner city bus or anything, we, we keep in mind that alternative modes is not just an RPC primary issue. It's a, it's a state and multi-state issue as well. It's a, it's a big federal, <coughs> objective is that we're considering all modes whenever we make So I guess effort. I really wish that were purple or mm -hmm. whatever that color is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other comments for the 10 year plan? All right. <coughs> now on the agenda, five project updates. We have Mark, Dan, Cynthia, and anyone else has? <coughs> Questions. All right. Um, I guess I'll I'll start this off. I just wanted to show folks um, the annual listing for 2012 is on the internet. Click on that page, uh, you can download it, and I believe on our annual listing page in the transportation area, yeah, we have a, a map of all the, the projects that were obligated for the previous or had funding obligated for the previous year. Um, so I guess that's the that's the first thing. Um, oh, second thing, our unified planning work program, especially our scope of work for the next two-year period, is being updated very soon. Um, we are nearing the end of our our last UPWP. Uh, it'll be finishing up in June, and we need to set the scope of work for the next two years 
We were hoping to have a draft ready for TAC to take a look at um, in February at our meeting. We don't expect the scope of work to change significantly. We may be expanding some of the categories and tasks that are in there currently to allow us to do a few more planning activities, but we're pretty happy with how uh, the UPWP worked out over this past two-year period, and um, it's been easy to track. It's been easy for us to understand. Um, and we've had no issues with administration or any of the other, um, the other things that go around with, with keeping track of a grant. So, uh, yeah, we hope to have that available to review within a month here. Um, the third thing I want to talk about, project update, is uh, we're getting into updating our, a more complete, full overhaul of our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. This is our long-range uh, 20 plus year plan that basically sets the vision for the region um, as far as transportation goes and also discusses some of the tactics that we're going to use to achieve that vision over time. This, this document also includes that giant project list that uh, we approved back in October. Um, it has all, all the financial constraint that we approved back in October. Um, so what I've, I've handed out is just this cover page here and then an outline of what we expect the document to turn into. And if you haven't seen Metro Metropolitan Transportation Plan lately, it is a very thick document. It has a lot of different chapters that are really, I think at this point, a little bit siloed. Uh, we have you know, the natural resources, uh, alternative fuels, transit. Uh, everything is really a, kind of a standalone chapter and what we're really trying to do um, with this update is, is kind of change change this document from kind of a, a guide about what all these things are to an actionable planning document um, so what we're going to be doing is kind of giving an outline for the executive summary of what a region is what a metropolitan plan is um, some of our outreach procedures. We're going to talk about the federal highways and federal transit planning factors that are important and just give a brief review of those things. Um, we have safety, security, environment, energy, climate change down the list here. And then we're kind of going to give a summary of the region as it stands now. You know, where are we? What does our region look like? What do the roads look like? Where do we have congestion or safety issues? Um, talk about some of the challenges within the region um, that we want to overcome um, over the next 25 or 30 years. And then we're going to you know, set out a vision for the region. Um, and this is really there's two reasons we're doing this. I think it's, it's easier to understand when you have a starting point and an end point, and then you're able to you know, have a number of steps, short, medium, and long term, to help you achieve that. But also, it's going to line up nicely with um, the Grand State Futures project that we're doing. And we're hoping to um, really talk about these different uh, topics, safety, security, economy, in a more holistic way, because all these things overlap. Um, it's not just transportation. Transportation is a component that helps us achieve these goals um, that you know this document will be focusing on. but. There's all these other things. We want to recognize that. We don't want the document as siloed as it was before into just, you know, different things, economy, uh, uh, energy, environment, those types of things, just siloed. We want those to overlap and talk about how they, they really um, impact each other. So we have a new outline here. If anybody has any suggestions or ideas for the outline, I'd be happy to hear any. Um, this is going to be a pretty long process. We're hoping to have a good chunk done probably by the end of this UPWP and hopefully to have it completed um, sometime at the end of, I guess, probably about a year from now. Okay. Thank you. Mark, could you talk about the public involvement part of it? <coughs> um, for this I'm not exactly sure what. So, um, I guess, I, Mr. Chair, if I can skip ahead to 
Please do. Uh, so one of the projects we're going to be working on in Maryland is going to um, be the lead on the uh, update of our public involvement plan. And so she and I have been doing some research and trying to figure out what, where to go with that to uh, bring it into the digital age so that we fully incorporate um, social media and other factors and looking at a citizens advisory committee. So as part of that process, one of the things that we need to look at is one of the first steps we'll take on our metro plan is to prepare a public outreach plan. So what it is that we plan to do to involve the public during the process of updating our plan. And then as we go through that, we'll add the data and the reports in for meetings and the comments we receive so it'll be fully documented and we have some really excellent models from throughout the country from other MPOs that we're going to be using so um, I'm pretty excited about this and looking for this is a, a really good opportunity to to address this before we get, begin the process so in February you should be seeing our public involvement and outreach plan to update the Metro and then um, we want the public involvement plan done by the end of June. So we just step that backwards because that's a 45 day review, not a 30 day. So um, that'll be coming to, it's a very busy six months. I guess that's what I'm trying to say with an upbeat message. We're gonna be really busy for the next year. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I, I think these new documents are gonna be really good and I think the next part I need to say links to our update of our, lo our local regional master plan. So um, we're finishing up our almost our first year with the Granite State Futures regional master plans and the first part um, we spent on gathering together the statewide data and that is now in the process of being uh, final reviews and comments on it from statewide agencies and then that will be up on our website for use of the regional um, entities who are developing their plan. So we've done sort of the top level statewide, now we're focusing on the bottoms up local municipalities. So for that effort, um, Greg has just finished up a matrix that looks at all the policies in our region. So this was done on the statewide level, and Greg has just completed um, the this for our region. And so this week he just finished our, here's our metro plan is about this thick, right? <laughs> and um, he finished pulling out all of the policies in there and putting them into the categories for, uh, for uh, our regional master plan. We've done the same thing with all of your communities, with UNH. Um, at the regional level, we've included regional plans that weren't included in the statewide. So that document is available, and we're taking that out um, to the planners and having them um, run through that and make sure uh, that it meets, uh, that we've categorized and slotted things, you know, just like with this, we took policies and slotted them into categories. So we would like you and your boards to look at that and review it. So um, so there's that information available to use on the preparation of our Metro plan. There's also all the outreach. We have over 500 comments. We have eight new events um, scheduled for our outreach for our regional master plan. And um, right now there's three major themes that are evolving. The first one is recreation and environment, the second one's community, and the third one is transportation. So um, besides this policy matrix, we have a large amount of comments that we're receiving through our regional master plan process that focus on transportation. So the next part of this is an ask um, so anyone who's interested in this process and is a member of TAC or policy or just a member of the public and you would like to be 
part of our transportation um, advisory committee for our regional master plan. Please um, see me or Mark or Dan, Marilyn, Greg, and let us know that you're enthusiastic and want to be involved. I don't envision this being a commitment more than once a month at the most. Um, it actually at the statewide level took less than that and we did a lot of our work um, by phone conference calls so you don't need to get in the car and travel somewhere. Um, we can do it by phone very efficiently and by putting um, documents up on Google Docs and working collaboratively. So um, we'd be really interested. We know we have really good talented visionaries in this in this region. So please, um, if you're interested and want to be a part of this, um, it's a 20-year plan and we'd love to have you in the club. I think one of the really nice things is the yeah, the regional master plan is really feeding into the metro plan and they're kind of uh, just getting some synergy, um, updating them both at the same time. Be able, to be able to use a lot of the information that Cynthia was just talking about to form uh, the public participation part of the metro plan. Okay. Uh, John, do you have any? Yes. Uh, quick update. I know, well, as you may know, let's see, January and June were supposed to be the months where we give an ITS update uh, about the ITS uh, architecture and strategic plan that we approved back in July. Um, but we have another project updates uh, because there are no updates. Uh, that need to be made to the ITS plan. I touched base with uh, the TMC over at DOT, uh, asked them if, if there have been any new ITS in the region, um, and there hasn't been, which, you know, it's, it's not a big surprise that there aren't any major updates at this point. We just approved the plan in uh, July, and it's already in the middle of the construction season, so it's, but, uh, Hopefully, I'm going to give a little update in June. There will be something to talk about and maybe approve uh, a change to our ITS uh, strategic plan. Um, but for this month, there are no, no significant changes. I, mean, I know I didn't touch base with UNH or um, uh, Coast about any you know, maybe real-time transit updates or any, any, anything like that. But as, as far as we're aware of, I don't, I don't know that there's been anything implemented or any large significant progress or maybe maybe there has been that yes. we don't know about but all right, right yeah. you want me to wait and if you if you'd like to yeah so. sure well one of the things i did want to update the group on related to uh, its is uh, unh has selected a firm uh, third-party firm to provide the real-time transit services and uh, we expect to have that uh, operating in beta within the next 60 days and our goal is that it's fully operative by September, start of our fall semester. So that's a, a CMAC funded project to provide real-time transit for all the Wildcat transit and campus connector systems. So we're very excited that that's moving ahead very uh, aggressively. Uh, it will be basically a web uh, information pushed out onto the web, but we will have some fixed um, status displays on campus as well for the bus system so we're, we're very excited about that and uh, hopefully next meeting or shortly thereafter I'll, I'll bring the Wildcat Transit folks in and they can do a, a presentation to you on how that's going to work and who the vendor is and all of that. So. One other ITS, I guess, ITS related update, um, we just got our uh, our approval letter so that we are now an affiliate member of the IT or the uh, I-95 corridor coalition um, and what that means is we now are seeking access to their um, vehicle probe project data which is um, real-time and historic archived traffic data on the I-95 corridor, the 93 corridor, and major <coughs> routes um, like uh, Route 125, Route 16, 
believe Route 4. Um, I think those are the routes. Um, but you can find out more about the, the vehicle probe project by coming to the I-95 Corridor Coalition. Clicking on this, um, this is a partnership with INRIX, which is the data collection company. They have contracts with a number of different car companies and I think cell phone manufacturers at this point. I'm not entirely sure how they, they get their data. Um, it's all legal. It's a <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, this is really great. It's free data for us. Um, it's a historic data also, so we can see trouble areas over time. Um, and there's some, some pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff that we can do with the data and we can really use to help um, not only inform our project prioritization, understanding where the projects need to happen, understanding where the real safety issues are, um, but also we save a lot of money by not having to go out and drive these roads and do our own traffic delay um, probe runs. So uh, we're really excited about that. We're yeah, working with the I-95 Corridor Coalition currently to uh, just gain access to the data. All right, that's that. Anyone else have updates for projects? Um, the yes. new market, um, small update, if you recall at our last meeting, we announced that our, our pedestrian bridge came in way over budget, uh, twice the amount of money that we have available. So that has forced us to go back and to the drawing board, so to speak, and our engineer has come up with a conceptual design that eliminates the um, steer and the elevated tower and actually provides handicap access through a ramp system that would come from the rear where there's a parking lot currently. And um, we're gonna be having a presentation at the town council on January 16th, I believe it is, um, showing the new plan and to you know get some feedback from our town council and get some public comment. But we are hopeful that um, this new concept will be embraced and that we can move forward with our stakeholder meetings that we sort of put on hold because we wanted to at least come in with the design that was within budget. And our, we are optimistic that the new design will be and budget, and we'll be able to move forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Steven? Um, I wanted to update you on the uh, planned uh, Rochester to Durham Wildcat Transit Service on 125. This is another uh, CMAC funded project. We had hoped to get that service started this year, but uh, there's apparently been a delay on the Rochester park and ride end, and we really can't have the service running until there is a terminus. Um, so I wanted to encourage maybe uh, the MPO and or the DOT at our next meeting to give us an update on what's going on with the park and ride. We've been kind of looking around for uh, options that we could uh, proceed on our own with uh, negotiated agreement with private property holders for a temporary terminus, but we've been unsuccessful in that. So the bottom line is the the transit service is on hold until we get a better idea of when the park and ride might be built. I can actually pro provide a little bit of an update about the, the Rochester park and ride. Um, they didn't go to construction last year because they're having access issues and they needed to come to an agreement about how they were going to access the property. Um, the construction year has moved out one year, so it's supposed to be happening in I think 2013, we just had a minor revision about that last month. Um, and an idea for a place to talk to, I know the Home Depot allows people to do park and ride kind of things up by exit 15, I'm pretty sure. Um, we talked to the, uh, is it the Lowe's that's directly across the street? That's the where Lowe's it would be my suggestion. Yeah, they turn us down. They're yeah. not willing to have us use that as a park and ride or have our buses go in there, so. We're still, yes. we're looking for other ideas in Rochester. The Home uh, Depot will add a few minutes to the trip, definitely. But it, um, they, they're at a meeting here last year, and I think they already allow it to be used as an informal park and ride. My, um, my, my suggestion would be, having worked in Rochester, I know we, they were going through the approval process for another restaurant that was going to use up some of the parking spaces. The parking situation over there right now is pretty maxed out. Is I, it? I, 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 it was with an addition of another restaurant, 
Mm-hmm. Are you talking Lowe's or Home Depot? Home Depot. I, I mean, I would just... Yeah. Not that I wouldn't want to see it happen, but I know when we were looking at the restaurant that was going in, that there were questions about how many... Although Home Depot has the option. They have space out back. They have parking spaces they never built. So that, you know, that's a possibility. Yep. Over the short term, perhaps. It, it's, it's, you know, we obviously, to go on private property, we have to negotiate agreement. There are yep. frequently costs involved. There's liability insurance. There's the bus... Mm-hmm bus turnaround. So I guess we need to focus on that a little bit. Uh, we'd love to get the service running, but... Uh, mm-hmm. And this is primarily for staff, right? This is primarily, it, this is a weekday service, Monday through Friday, uh, oriented towards faculty staff. Um, I believe we've even completed the bus procurement part of the project, so it's a matter of finding a home for the end of the line, basically. So. How about the lot next to the gas station and the Dunkin' Donuts on exit 13? Yeah, I'm, I know uh, Dirk Timmons, our transit director, has been <laughs> calling and trying to find, yeah. so I'm not updated on the it's latest. A, it's an so empty it's lot right next to the gas station there. And I think during the you know spring, summer, it's used for gravel and loam and mulch. And it would have to be paved, though. I mean, it has to be a paved job. I don't know, but we'll look at this here. Another consideration, exit 15, Thompson Center Arms. The main buildings, I think, are going to be taken down, but there is a newer, now empty store that was associated with them. Yeah. Uh, Fox Ridge or something? Yeah, that was supposed to turn into some office space. I know they had come through for approval for some office space from there. I don't know if it ever materialized. doesn't look like anything is going on. They do now have heavy equipment in there, I think, to start <coughs> destruction of the some of the main buildings of the former plant. I would contact Jim Campbell over in Rochester and see mm, what he's What's going in there, do we know? I thought I heard car dealerships, but that's an awful big area oh. for car dealerships. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else for project updates? Yes. Uh, speaking of parking, uh, parking rights, uh, what's the status of the uh, 125 on the blue circle? Um, I haven't heard anything back from uh, DOT. We were, they did shoot us an email a couple of months ago <coughs> saying that they're almost ready to have a, a stakeholder meeting with us and some transit folks, and I haven't heard anything since then. So. Are the landowners still on board with the idea? As far as I know, yep. yep. So I drive by. Yeah, I should, uh, I'll follow up on that. Because you need that lot We need also. that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think My somehow we got out ahead of the gate on this, uh, <laughs> which is unusual, but. Well, then the goal would be to coordinate those two parking lot lots right. together. Right, right. I know that Ron is very, um, adamant about the Rochester park and ride. They just did the right-of-way settlement, but we had to do the minor last month to increase the right-of-way amount to cover that. So we did that, but now we, because we increased the cost, we need to increase the construction costs for this construction season, which will be in a minute. Mm-hmm. So you'll be seeing that this month. Uh, do we know oh, when so the amendment is? Uh, yes, the construction is, uh, I'm doing it as soon as I leave here today, <laughs> and still waiting on updated estimates from a couple projects. Mm-hmm. Is that the, f- yep. the, if I may, the tip amendment? Is that going to be our first amendment? Is that, yes. Are you hoping to have that in front of us at our next meeting in February? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, should, yep. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. It should be. We're going to have interagency next week. We'll be discussing it during the interagency. Because we have our FTA project. Your project is in there, so I got it. I have a question. If you do this corridor, are you planning to stop at the park and ride that's in Barrington? Is it a very small one? 9 and 125? Yeah. There are several stops on the 125 corridor, but that was proposed as one. Not necessarily pulling in, but on 125. 
you know, it's right at the intersection of one. Okay, yeah. and I and I have had conversations with Kevin Russell up there because we're, they're going to do some repaving. We're talking about trying to add a, some turning lanes and maybe even a, some kind of pedestrian light, trying to improve that intersection okay. somewhere. If if we do have in the future have some projects go forward in that area, would it yes. would it be something to think about expanding that parking ride a little or? Sure, I mean, but from our our immediate concern would be just uh, a bus pull out or stop in your design so that it's appropriately designed. With so if you want something on 125, if we're doing the repaving next yep. year, that would be the perfect yep. time to do it. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right, any other updates? And I, just to follow along with that, um, that what we're hearing from the comments we're receiving is that people want more transit options and they want expansion of the transit services and parking lots. So uh, we're doing a really good job using them and, and the, the, the need for them and the desire to have them in place is expanding and the public gets it. <laughs> Hopeful that we can uh, use things besides just the automobile, one driver in it. Good. All right, number six, please. Other business. I have two, three people. Greg, you yeah. want to go first? Or someone else? All right. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick updates. Um, if you aren't aware, the uh, town of Barrington declared a development of regional impact on Green Hill Road for a gravel excavation operation that's going to be exiting onto 125 and 202. Um, we put our draft technical review together and the uh, Regional Impact Committee met on December 21st. Uh, they approved the technical review. We finalized it, put our packet together, and uh, the entire report is up on the website. Uh, I think Barrington has a meeting on January 8th. Yeah, we have a Tuesday, and uh, we're doing a, the applicant's actually going to hold a, a neighborhood meeting okay. uh, in Barrington, but for Rochester and Barrington folks, too. I mean, there was some, there was some transportation related issues associated with that project, so um, you know, we urge you all to take a look at the report if you have any input. Um, and the other project update is we're still working on the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the culvert inventory. Um, we have five of the towns submitted so far. Uh, we just collected the remaining information that was requested by the geologic survey uh, from Barrington. And um, I just spoke with Shane Shickey, who's their senior hydrogeomorphologist, and he is running our data through uh, two tools. Actually started with Summersworth's data. Um, the, the tool is the geomorphic compatibility tool, which basically takes all of our measurements that we collected in the field and runs it through a model, which will output um, a rating for that structure as to whether it's in need of replacement, if it's you know transmitting stormwater efficiently, you know things like that. And there's another tool uh, called the Aquatic Organisms Passage Tool, which does the same thing and uh, basically outputs. Um, it, it tells you whether or not andromedous species like salmon, salmonoids, different uh, aquatic organisms can actually pass through the structure. So it kind of gives you a, an idea of uh, if they need to be replaced for that for that attribute. So uh, we're working on that right now, and I'm ho hoping to have a final uh, certification from Shane on the five towns that we've submitted in the next couple of weeks. So that's what I've got so far. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kyle. Yeah, just a, a quick announcement about um, a presentation that we're having here on January 16th. Um, Prep is going to come and speak about the State of the Estuary report that they put out. Um, it's a report that's uh, put out every three years, and they had their conference uh, December 7th in Portsmouth. If you weren't able to attend, um, they're doing these sort of rollout events where they're bringing, um, you know, the information out to, the, to any uh, parties. So we're partnering up with the Kachiko River Local Advisory Committee and PREP. They're coming to speak about um, the indicators in the uh, in the report, um, what the state of the health is of the Great Bay and the, the Hampton and Seabrook um, estuaries. Um, I know that there's been a lot of debate about some of the nitrogen loads with wastewater, and if you do have concerns about that, this might be a good time to sort of voice those, because um, we'll have a few speakers from, from PEP here to, to talk about it. Uh, they're also going to bring at least 20 to 30 copies of the report, so if you're interested in getting a copy, we have a few here at the office, but 
Um, if you want to take a quick look through, but I know that they said they were going to bring around 30 to 40 copies. So if you're able to attend, um, it might be a good opportunity to sort of get any questions that you might have about the report. Could I follow up? Sure. Um, and then in coordination with this at our commission meeting on Thursday, January 24th, um, we are going to have Ray Kaninsky, um, who is a PhD uh, doctorate, and he works for the Nature Conservancy in Newmarket, and he's been working with Ray Grizzle at UNH on the oyster res restoration um, program. So uh, I know there's people on the planning board in Newmarket that are growing oyster spat off their docks in the Lamprey River, and some people over in, in um, the Bellamy and the Oyster are also growing oyster spat off their docks, and so um, there's a lot of interest, and so we're, we're uh, providing this presentation to, um, because this is a great effort on the part of UNH and also the Nature Conservancy to restore oyster beds, functioning oyster beds to our to our region, and so it's a pretty exciting project, and it's gotten a lot of publicity from WMUR when they dump the oyster in clamshell. Every year they do about an acre to two acres dump into the um, various rivers at, at where the former oyster beds were, and it's very exciting. And the people growing this fat are having the competition to see who's getting the biggest spat at the end of the season. And so far, it's been successful, and it's modeled after the program going on in the Chesapeake Bay. So in January, we're looking at our estuaries from various um, viewpoints. And one of them is very much, you can get involved in this. If you happen to live on the river, you can grow oyster spat off your docks. So. <laughs> And the help of those nitrogen levels. Yes, it helps <laughs> with the nitrogen yeah. levels, which is good for tax paper payers and people in those um, wastewater districts. Do you have to have a docker as long as you have access? I don't know, but that's what we could. They hang them in bags off the docks. Oh, okay, so that's that something from one Yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, wanted to pass along a compliment to, to DOT. We, um, Durham and uh, UNH have been uh, very happy with uh, DOT's project manager on the 108 from Durham to Newmarket project. And uh, he met uh, with the uh, Wildcat Transit staff and we actually rode the entire corridor reviewing the bus pullouts and making sure they were designed correctly. And um, I never recall that level of integration of a project design with the transit provider in many many years and we're very pleased with that and very pleased with uh, the commissioner uh, you know coming to the town of Durham and you know stating specifically that that project's a priority to get done uh, we know how dangerous that route has been and uh, are very hopeful that the DOT gets enough funding to, to deal with the, the bigger issues of bridge replacements and things that have evolved over the 10 year plus delay of that project given the weather we've had etc cetera, etc cetera. so I just wanted to pass along that uh, update to the group and compliment to the DOT uh, that's working with us on that project I, I could yeah. add something to that um, I was watching as a new market resident I was watching the planning board and our town planner here my town planner and um, uh, they were talking about development and changing of zoning districts along Route 108 and it just triggered something in my mind so I went in and talked to Mark and, and um, we looked at the, uh, the diagram for the design and um, I think this really going along with this, this project is turned into a complete street um, because the sidewalks are going to extend up to Stagecoach Lane in Durham. And so we're actually going to have sidewalks all the way through um, uh, Newmarket up to the town line border with Durham. And then it'll extend up to Stagecoach Lane, where there used to be um, a bed and breakfast, which is now turned into an assisted living. And driving through there every day, I've seen people out walking from that assisted living uh, community, so I think this is 
going to be very interesting as we integrate the transit stops and the sidewalks and just look at, at how this morphs with changes in zoning and um, new facilities coming in. So it's a very interesting project and I really appreciate the effort that the district is doing to keep the road maintained. You know, with the conditions there, it's very challenging and then the design, you know. So thank you to the DOT for their efforts on, on this project. I have, a, I have a question. How are you getting the town to buy into the maintenance of the sidewalks? Because that, I, not only, you know, Barrington doesn't have any sidewalks, and in, in, in some areas, it, in order to do some of the things they want to do, I think it's kind of a necessity. But even in like a community like Dover, where I live, it's very hard to sell more sidewalks when they now feel like legally they have to maintain them and have to plow them. Um, has always been in support of the project from mm -hmm. the very start, so I don't think that's going to be problems. I don't know. Things would change. And, and you do have the local, local, local oh. department. That you yeah, because they'll, 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 they'll have to, they'll have to, they'll have to plow the sidewalk. Yeah. And we paid a five dollar fee for transportation, the local transportation. Part of, is that your tip tax or whatever that, that, that local when you option. register? Yeah, the local option. Yeah. Auto fee registration. Yeah, yeah, because actually we have that in Dover. Mm -hmm. And but. and until the if, correct me if I'm wrong, but until the downtown and the economy that was used for the sidewalks for well construction. Or yeah, construction. construction. Yeah, it's the maintenance and so it's <coughs> All right, Marilyn, I think you're in. Um, I just wanted to mention that the planning land use regulation handbooks are in. So if anybody would like to take them with you today, um, we've got plenty of staff that can help you bring them out to your car. And I just need you to come and see me after if you'd like them. That'd be great. Thank you. <coughs> I'm parked up at a Home Depot. Is that all right? Like, well, <laughs> I feel like I'm almost at Home Depot when I have to walk. I'll have to drive back here. All right. During each of our meetings, we have something called Citizens Forum. It's a chance for citizens who are not technically members of this committee to come and voice thoughts and opinions on the topics of the day. I'm not sure we have any non-member citizens here today, but they are encouraged to come and participate in the subjects that we're talking about at each meeting. All right, anything else for the good of the committee? Then I would ask for a motion for adjournment. Um, second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. <laughs>